Richard Waller, Executive Director of the University Museums at the University of Richmond. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm sorry we don't have enough chairs in, in the Brown Alley room for you. Uh, but again, I, I'm going to offer up this front space if you want to uh, sit on the floor. Um, thank you for joining us for the opening of our exhibition, Robert Cotier, <coughs> Vietnam War Photographs, in the Laura Robbins Gallery of Design and Nature. Organized by the University Museums, the exhibition was curated by myself in collaboration with Robert Cotier. The exhibition commemorates the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the United States involvement in the Vietnam War. Robert Odiern was a 21-year-old freelance photojournalist when he made his first trip to Vietnam in 1966. He returned in 1969 as a soldier assigned to the uh, Pacific Star and Stripes in Saigon, where he spent another 14 months. He returned home from Vietnam for the last time in April 1970. The exhibition includes more than 40 photographs from his coverage of the war in Vietnam. Today, Robert continues as a photojournalist and is associate professor of journalism and chair of the Department of Journalism here at the University of Richmond. The title of his talk this evening is Young and Hungry, uh, a freelance photographer in also known as Skinny Bob in the dead weight. <laughs> <laughs> what he's telling us. Um, following Robert's lecture, if we have time, we will take a few questions. Then please join us for the reception and to see the exhibition. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hogan. Thank you, Richard. Richard, thank you for that very, uh, very kind introduction. And, and you were right. We should have charged uh, ad admission uh, tonight. I, I thought if we gave the tickets away, uh, it would be better. Um, er every war has its music soundtrack. Um, the Civil War had uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic and, and Dixie. Uh, World War I had songs like Over There and It's a Long, Long Way to Tipperary. World War II had a great soundtrack, all those big bands. The Korean War kind of got shafted on the music front, but then the Korean War pretty well got shafted all the way around. And then there was the Vietnam War, the first rock and roll war. What you were listening to tonight as you came in, if you could hear it, was a playlist of some Vietnam music. How many Vietnam veterans do we have in the room? Could the Vietnam veterans in the room stand up, please, for a second? I'm guessing if you ask those guys to come up with a playlist, uh, it might be different than the songs that would be on my playlist. Uh, everybody fought a slightly different war. But what you got was a very personal playlist of mine. And that's what you're going to get this evening, is a very personal conversation about what it was like to be a young, skinny, uh, freelance photographer in Vietnam. And if you stumble across any other lessons uh, in this lecture tonight, anything about the meaning of military media relations and what impact that may have had on the way the war was conducted. If you stumble across anything like that, it's an accident. Um, this, is, this is just a very personal recollection. In the 1960s, when I was in college, about the coolest thing now, not about, the coolest thing you could be was a rock musician. But I don't play a musical instrument, I really don't have any sense of rhythm, and ask my wife, she'll tell you, I can't carry a tune. So that pretty much eliminated rock musician. But the second coolest thing I thought you could be was a photographer. And um, there were lots of popular culture hints about why a young guy might want to be a photographer. Um, movies like Blow Up. Hell, even some of the rock musicians wanted to be photographers. Um, but I, I wanted to be a photographer, and, and the, my feeling that that was a cool thing to be was solidified for me during my sophomore year at Grinnell College in Iowa, 
uh, when three other guys and I, all working for the student newspaper, cut classes for a couple of weeks and went down to Selma, Alabama to cover the civil rights demonstrations there. And I had lined up a little freelance radio reporting gig to help defray the expenses. And it came to pass one day that I found myself sitting quite literally at the knees of Martin Luther King as he stood on the Dallas County Courthouse steps in Selma speaking to the protesters. So there I am holding my microphone up, catching every word that he's recording. And right next to me, um, brushing elbows with me, was legendary Life Magazine photographer Flip Schulke. Now I say legendary Life Magazine photographer, they were all legendary. But to my way of thinking, Flip was especially cool. I mean, how could you not be with a name like Flip? <laughs> Even if sometimes you wore pretty silly hats. So Flip's sitting right next to me. I'm holding my microphone up. King is speaking. And at one point, Flip leans over to me and whispers words in my ear, words that have stuck with me all these years. Kid, he said, get your damn microphone out of my picture. <laughs> This is the picture he took. Uh, my hand is about right there. Uh, and you can see the archbishop uh, looks like he's scowling at me. Uh, I'm not sure he was scowling at me, but he's certainly scowling. That's as close as I ever came to being on the cover of Life magazine. Um, but more than wanting to be on the cover of Life magazine, I wanted one of my photographs to be on the cover of Life magazine. The next year, my junior year in college, in February, one of the leading photography magazines, popular photography magazine, ran an article about war photographers in Vietnam. And one of the themes of um, that article was that there weren't enough photographers in Vietnam. And it quoted UPI's photo chief in Saigon, a fellow named Dirk Halstead, as saying, in effect, if you were young and hungry, and wanted to be rich and famous, Vietnam was the place to be. So I wrote Dirk. Dear Mr. Halstead, I wrote, I'm young and hungry. I want to be rich and famous. What can you do for me? Sincerely, Bob. Now, I can imagine the howls of laughter in the crusty war reporters and photographers in the UPI Bureau when he read my letter out loud to them. And I can imagine the appreciative chortles at his droll response to me. Dear Bob, he wrote, drop by the Saigon office and we'll talk. <laughs> Sincerely, Dirk. Well, I took that as a job offer. <laughs> so, taking the money that was meant for my senior year, I bought a one-way plane ticket to Vietnam with a layover in Hong Kong to buy a couple of Nikon FT bodies, an assortment of lenses, and a Luna 6 light meter. I got into Saigon real late one night, after midnight. In my first 24 hours in Vietnam, I had two really lucky things happen to me, and I learned two really important lessons. The very first lucky thing that happened to me happened right at that hotel. As I was checking in, I laid down my portfolio of pictures on the front desk and forgot them, never to be seen again. Now, I say this was lucky because it was a pretty damn skimpy portfolio of pictures. At that point in my life, I had never had a picture published in a professional publication. It had all been student newspaper stuff. And I think if I had presented that portfolio to Dirk, things might have turned out a little differently than, than they ended up doing. So the next morning, I present myself at the UPI Bureau at 19 No Decay, half a block off of Tudo Street, wearing a coat and tie, because that's what you did, uh, or at least I thought you did. It was a picture from my passport in those days. So I walked in and I stand in front of Dirk's desk and I hand him his letter. Dear Bob, drop by the Saigon office and we'll talk. He read it, looked up at me, and I said, let's talk. <laughs> well, here's where the first lucky thing that happened to me in my first 24 hours, second lucky thing. In addition to the central government fighting uh, communist insurgency, they were also having trouble with Buddhists, who were upset that they didn't have a bigger say in the government, which was dominated by Catholics. And Buddhists were actually rioting. Uh, Buddhists and riot, you don't normally find in, in the same sentence, but they were rioting. And in this particular week, 
the center of trouble was in Hue, the old imperial capital in the northern part of South Vietnam. And all of Dirk's photographers were either in Hue, uh, covering the riots there, or they were out in the field covering combat. He had no photographers in Saigon. And as my luck would have it, rioting broke out in Saigon at the Vinhua Dao Pagoda, the largest uh, Buddhist pagoda in Saigon. And so Dirk looked at me and said, kid, take your coat and tie off and go with this guy. This guy was, is Dan Sutherland. And Dan is a slender, bookish, bespeckled fellow who by Saigon press corps standards actually qualified as an intellectual. He had a master's degree in Far Eastern studies from Harvard. He spoke fluent French, was learning Vietnamese. And uh, so off I go with, uh, with Dan. Uh, we get in the office vehicle, this mini moat. That is the actual vehicle, and that is Dan. This wasn't the day in question, but you know, you know, can't have a picture of everything. So off we go. Dan is driving, and I'm in the passenger seat. We get a few blocks from the pagoda, and the Vietnamese police have set up a roadblock. And they stop us, and they say, you can't go any further. And Dan says, oh, yes, we can. We're American journalists. And the Vietnamese policeman says, no, you can't go any further. Dan says, oh, yes, we can. Whereupon, the Vietnamese policeman pulls his pistol and holds it up to Dan's head and says, no, you can't. Dan puts the mini moat in gear, hits the gas, off we go, and I'm sitting there thinking, I am so far over my head here. <laughs> this is where I learned my two important lessons. The first important lesson involved tear gas. I was of the firmly held belief, based upon no empirical evidence whatsoever, that you could overcome the effects of tear gas by force of will. And I had ample opportunity to consider the folly of that position as I sat on the curb barfing my guts up. The Vietnamese police were using tear gas with great abundance. The second important lesson I learned is that riots are actually pretty easy to photograph. Uh, pretty much any direction you point the camera, you're going to get a, a decent picture. So I made my pictures. Dan interviewed his people. We went back to the UPI Bureau. And um, I turned my film in. They developed it. And Dirk bought five of my pictures and moved them by radio telephone from Saigon to New York. Now, five pictures was a lot for one story. It was expensive to transmit them back to New York, and UPI is famously cheap. Um, and they paid me the princely sum of $15 per picture. Now, lest you think that was really a ridiculously small amount, in current dollars, that works out to about $110. So, you know, $550 for my first day's work. Whoopee, this is going to be easy. Based on that first lucky day, Dirk was laboring under the misapprehension that I actually knew what I was doing. And based on that, they, UPI, supported me for press credentials. And uh, those press credentials, the military press credentials, got you the ultimate e-ticket rides. You could hitch rides on all the military aircraft. You were to be treated with the protocol rank of a field grade officer. There I am, a 21-year-old college dropout being treated like a major. Um, and you could fly any place. You could hitch rides on these planes and go anywhere. Um, I tell you this story, and, and by the way, that made me at that point the youngest person ever fully accredited to cover the war. But I wasn't the only young, ambitious, inexperienced photographer in the war. There were guys like um, Tim Page, uh, Dana Stone, Catherine Leroy, a little more about her later, uh, Sean Flynn. Poor Sean, you can't mention Sean's name without mentioning that he was Errol Flynn's son. Uh, Robert Ellison, all these guys, young, ambitious, um, and freelancing in Vietnam. Here's pretty much the way it worked for us in Vietnam. I'd get up in the morning in my apartment in Saigon, put on my jungle fatigues, get my cameras, get in a cab to go out to the airport, stop at my favorite cafe, pick up a couple of croissants and a cup of coffee, get out to the airport, catch a C-130 cargo plane, and fly out to one of the major bases, maybe uh, on K where the first cab was, or maybe up at Da Nang where the Marines were. And when you got there, you either went to the public affairs office and asked, hey, guys, what's going on? Can you get to me where the action is? Or better yet, you just went to where the helicopters staged. And um, um, oops, back there. And hitched a ride there, walking from helicopter to helicopter. You go in any place exciting, 
And if they were, they'd give you a ride. You get off, you take your pictures, wait for another helicopter to come, get a ride back, get on a cargo plane back to Saigon, turn your film in, shower, put on clean clothes, go out to a French restaurant for dinner, have a couple of glasses of wine, go to bed, get up the next morning and do it all over again. I was 21. I thought this was normal. <laughs> it was years later before I realized what a thoroughly bizarre existence that was. Um, I'm going to tell you a, a couple of war stories. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, right now about the very first operation I went on. And this happens, you know, I've been in country now maybe three or four days. And I went out with the 1st Infantry Division, which was operating just north of Saigon. That is I sitting atop an armored personnel carrier, an APC. And this particular operation, there were four or five APCs running along the road to make sure that the Viet Cong hadn't closed the road <clears throat> so the farmers could get their produce to market and so the shopkeepers could get their goods uh, out from the big cities. But to make sure we weren't ambushed, the Americans were firing artillery in front of us um, on either side of the road uh, to discourage the Viet Cong from setting up ambushes. One presumes it also discouraged the farmers from using the road to get to the market or the shopkeepers from getting their goods. But, you know, uh, that's the way of war. And so we're driving along, and they misplaced two rounds, landed right alongside the APC I was on, and blew me off the top of the APC. I landed flat on my back. It's a fall of about six feet. Knocked the wind out of me. If you've ever had the wind knocked out of you, you know you feel like you're dying. And it also peppered my arm and hand with shrapnel. And if you've ever cut your hand, you know it bleeds profusely, right? So I'm crawling back into this vehicle, and the commander is on the radio calling the vehicles up front. Hey, anybody hurt up there? No. Oh, good. Calls the vehicles behind him. Anybody hurt back there? No, nobody's hurt back there. Then he turns around, and he sees the civilian correspondent crawling into his vehicle with what looks like a bloody left stump. The color just drained from this poor guy's face. He thought he'd crippled the civilian correspondent, ruining his career. So he calls in an emergency medevac for me, the highest order of urgency that you can do. The helicopter comes screaming in. Two guys jump off with stretchers. They're a little confused to see me walking. <laughs> but they throw me in the helicopter. We race back to where the hospital is. And they've got the entire hospital staff out lining the sidewalk to the emergency room. <laughs> Because in the military, bad news as it travels to the rear gets worse. So it went from slightly wounded, no account, 21-year-old freelance photographer to critically wounded chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. <laughs> so they bring, me in, they bring me into the ER, and two doctors and nurse put my hand up over a um, stainless steel bowl, pour alcohol on it to wash the blood away. Their heads all go down. Their heads come up. Their heads go down. Their heads come up. And the one doctor, in a New York accent that I'm not going to try to imitate, said to me, so what do you want me to do, kid? Kiss it and make it well? <laughs> they got their revenge on me. They made me spend the night in the hospital um, because there was also a little piece of shrapnel in my shoulder, and they wanted to make sure it wasn't moving anywhere. It hasn't moved in 50 years. But they made me stay there. And it was one of the absolutely worst nights of my life. Not because I was in any pain, I wasn't. But lots of guys around me were. And one of them, the guy in the bunk next to me, died. And he didn't die quietly and peacefully. Um, as I say, one of the worst nights. The next day, the public affairs officer for the unit comes to me and he says, Bob, you know that Viet Cong mortar that wounded you yesterday? And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. That was U.S. artillery. That wasn't a Viet Cong mortar. That Viet Cong mortar <laughs> that wounded you, I said, no, 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 that was friendly fire. If that had been a Viet Cong mortar, I can get you a Purple Heart. <laughs> now, I hadn't been in the service at that point, but I had visions <laughs> of my first day in the service with my brand new uniform pinning a Purple Heart on it. And so I said, well, it could have been a uh, Viet Cong mortar. And that's how the story went out. 21-year-old freelancer injured by Viet Cong mortar fire. I never did get my Purple Heart. And the public affairs officer knew perfectly well I was never going to get a Purple Heart. Civilians weren't authorized Purple Hearts at that time. It was an important lesson about public affairs officers. 
We used to say in Vietnam, you can tell if the public affairs officer is lying by looking to see if his lips are moving. <laughs> I want to tell you about another operation. This one took place on Valentine's Day, 1967. Now, it was common when you went into the field as a journalist to go with another journalist. Um, the, the joke was, if something awful happened to you, you wanted to have pictures of it. Uh, and so on this particular operation, I, had, I was accompanied by Dana Stone, who was another very young, inexperienced freelance photographer. Uh, he was stringing for the AP. I was stringing for UPI at the time. And also uh, Ebe Heller, who was a Danish newsreel photographer, and he was shooting for uh, UPI-TN, UPI Television News. He actually was a trained professional and knew what he was doing. Um, so this is a picture of where this fight that I'm going to talk about took place. This picture was taken a couple of days after the fight by a, an artillery officer. And the main company was right in here. Now apparently, we'd been out there a couple of days, and apparently we'd made it very clear to everybody that we were annoyed that there was nothing going on. And I say this is a, was apparent because every time I've encountered somebody from this unit in years since, they always start out by saying, oh, you're the guy who was bored. So in our boredom, the three journalists and a squad of six men wandered up over in this way just to look through some houses. The rest of the company started across this dike. And they got about there when North Vietnamese soldiers dug in here, opened fire on them. And in the opening onslaught, the platoon leader was killed, the platoon sergeant was killed, a couple of other guys were killed, and the company was pinned down out in that rice paddy unable to move. So they called the squad that we were with, that's the squad leader there talking on the radio, and told him to move his men around to the left to take some heat off the company and maybe they could withdraw or maneuver in some way. So we started moving from there and we got about here when we actually saw North Vietnamese soldiers here running that direction. That was one of maybe a four or five times in my two, two and a half years in Vietnam that I actually saw live enemy who weren't either wounded or prisoners. These guys were still after us. So the soldiers took them under fire and then we continued moving. We got about right here when we were ambushed ourselves and the opening salvo caught me and two guys out in the open and the guy on my left uh, was hit and the guy on my right was hit. I wasn't, but I was pinned down out in the open with these guys. It was the first time in the war that I thought they weren't shooting at us, they were shooting at me. And I didn't like that. I wanted to talk to them about that. You know, guys, you know, really. Um, so we ducked for cover. That's the sergeant. That's the sergeant directing his men. There they are firing on the other side of the little dike there where we were taking fire from. And here's the sergeant. He and I are pinned down out in the open. This guy is dead. That guy is badly wounded. And the sergeant is pretty perplexed. Dana and Ebe, meanwhile, have wonderful cover. They're in a nice ditch. Uh, and they're, that, that worked out well for me because they took some good pictures of me. Uh, here I am. And people have looked at that picture and said, why are you smiling? And I'm not smiling, I'm grimacing. Uh, but um, happily, Dana took some nice pictures. Eve also got some good video going. Oops, where is it? Come on. Play. Hmm. And I don't know why it's not playing. It's not going to play. It's a beautiful little sequence. Oh, here we go. That's I in the helmet running the wounded guy to cover. Dana took this picture. That's I with the helmet. The guy was shot in the face. That picture ended up on the front page of Stars and Stripes. And Ebe's um, film ended up on the CBS Evening News. And in both cases, it identified who I was. And the commanding general of the 1st Cavalry Division in the grand way that commanding generals do, said, whatever that young man wants, he gets. A couple of weeks later, I was with the first cab, and I was trying to get from point A to point B. 
and there was a battalion commander, a lieutenant colonel there with his helicopter, and I said, hey, colonel, can I get a ride over to point B? And he says, no, can't do it. He didn't like reporters. And just like in some Hollywood movie, in comes the commanding general in his helicopter, and he steps off, strides right by the lieutenant colonel, comes over to me and shakes my hand and says, Bob, how are things going? And I said, well, they're going great, General. I'm, I'm trying to get over to point B. He says, oh, the colonel's going there. You'll take him, won't you, colonel? <laughs> when I got back to Saigon from that fight, I looked at this picture. When I was first looking at it, I thought, holy cow, I've got my Robert Kappa Spanish loyalist moment of impact picture. I thought this was the guy standing next to me as he got shot. And I was really excited about that because that's a really rare picture to be able to get. It turns out it was just the sergeant diving for cover, so it wasn't my Robert Kappa moment. Now this guy, this sergeant, if I knew his name at the time, uh, I have forgotten it. Uh, wasn't in any notes I could find. But when the first Gulf War started, these pictures, this picture has been up on my office wall for years. And I put it up there to remind me that no matter how bad things got at the newspaper or the TV station where I was working, at least they weren't shooting at me. But I got curious about him. Whatever happened to this guy? So I posted his picture on some First Cav alumni sites. And um, right away, people said, oh, that's Sergeant Joe Musial. Joe is of a particular type. He was one of these garrison screw-up soldiers who just couldn't make it in peacetime. But in war, he was hell on wheels. He went into the Army in 1954, got promoted, busted, promoted, busted. By the time he went to Vietnam in 1966, 12 years in the service, he was an E-4. Draftees with a year in service were E-4s. But they put him in charge of an infantry unit, and he was hell on wheels. When I saw him, he was on his first of three tours in Vietnam. He won two silver stars, three bronze stars, three purple hearts, and was known universally in the first cab as Sergeant Rock, named after the World War II comic book character. The first cab was in the habit of naming LZs, landing zones and bases, after soldiers who died. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they only ever named one base after a living person, LZ Rock. That's the kind of reputation this guy had. But the guy said, if you want to talk to Rock, you're going to have to hurry because he's in the hospital, the VA hospital in Battle Creek. He's got lung cancer. He doesn't have long to live. So I drove up there and interviewed him. Of course, I arrived, and the first thing he says to me is, oh, you were one of those guys who was bored because there wasn't any action. <laughs> guys carry a grudge. Um, so I interviewed him and was doing a piece for Reader's Digest magazine. Um, don't laugh, they pay really well. Um, and the piece, journal, every, all the journalists in the room are going to laugh when I say this, it was one of those pieces that wrote itself. It just flowed right out of the, the computer, except for the ending. It didn't really have an ending to this. And I was struggling over it. And, um, one day, I got a phone call from his sister, who told me that Rock had died. And Rock died on Veterans Day. Made the perfect ending for the, the story. He was a hell of a soldier. I'm going to tell you one more story. This one, I was working for Stars and Stripes. Um, a little word about Stars and Stripes. Most of the editors were civilians. My boss in Saigon was a civilian. We lived in civilian housing. But all the reporters and photographers were military people. In fact, uh, Jim Clare, stand up. Drove all the way down here. Jim was one of those reporters at Stars and Stripes. Jim and I worked together there. Don't applaud him. He wasn't that good. Um, <laughs> I was worried he came down to fact check me. But among the reporters, that were working at Stars and Stripes, two of them went on to win Pulitzer Prizes. One of them became the editor of the Chicago Tribune, another the editor of the New York Sun. Uh, one of them was Steve Croft, who was a 60 Minutes correspondent for many years. They worked for magazines and newspapers like the Newsweek and the Washington Post. It was a pretty high-powered group of young guys who, as you might imagine, were probably pretty hard to get along with with the military. Uh, we had lots of fun. So the story that I'm going to tell you about 
was a, a battle that I went to in a place called the Hep Duck Valley, about 30 miles south of Da Nang. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the story that I wrote. The pictures are pictures I took at the battle. Now, that didn't cause much trouble, but the story uh, caused a bunch of trouble. So I'm going to put my glasses on here, and I'm going to read this story to you with your indulgence. Hep Duck Valley was the dateline. The fighting here is a very close, personal infantry fight. The valley bottom is dried terraces, each terrace three or four feet higher or lower than the one next to it. Around each of these tiny fields are thick hedgerows, and in the middle of the hedgerows are ditches and bunkers, ditches and bunkers that you just know Charlie is in. Bravo Company, 4th Battalion, 31st Infantry, AmeriCal Division knows it. They were here when it all started last week and have been chewed up and chewed up again until Thursday morning they numbered only 73 men and two officers. Thursday evening when the fighting was over they would number only 46 men and one officer. Thursday morning Bravo Company moved slowly forward, forward being the direction they had to move to join the Marines fighting from the other end of the valley. The Marines were just a few hundred meters ahead and everyone hoped this time they might find nothing in between. At 11 a.m., two machine guns, two AK-47s, and an M79 grenade launcher blew that hope away. Pinned down in the late morning sun, a very hot sun, Bravo had one man killed, a new guy, and 13 others wounded or nearly unconscious as a result of the heat, heat that sometimes reaches 120 degrees. Carefully, they pulled back, leaving their, the body of the new guy to evacuate their wounded. By 2 p.m., the 61 men of Bravo Company were ready to move back into the same area. No one really wanted to go. They just wanted to sit in the shade and be left alone. The company commander, Captain William H. Gaylor, explained the situation. There would be no helicopter gunship support. The gunships had more important things to do than support Bravo Company. Air and artillery couldn't be used because the Marines were too close. They had no mortars. The infantryman, with his rifle and grenades, was expected to dig out the North Vietnamese. Wearily, Bravo moved forward again, only to be pinned down almost at once. Low crawling ahead, the first 15 men were cut off from the rest of the company. Men who had been tired for days, men with no water, men who were really scared, were on their own. The man nearest the cutoff group was told to carry grenades forward to them. He refused, crawled back, and asked the medic for pills for his nerves. While hiding back with the wounded, the nervous soldier was wounded by an M79 grenade round fired by the NVA. While the rest of the company lay pinned down and helpless, the point group fought it out with Charlie. Late in the afternoon, just as darkness was coming, the point men managed to escape, crawling a few meters back to the rest of the company. Four more Americans were dead, their bodies still forward. The company threw out tear gas and, looking like monsters in their gas masks, tried to advance against the enemy to recover the bodies. They managed to get just one of them. Five more NVA were dead and two captured M60 machine guns were destroyed. As night fell, the company straggled back to find a place to sleep. Friday morning, more tired than Thursday morning, but now only 47 strong, Bravo knew they'd have to go back in to get the bodies. When that story appeared in Stars and Stripes, the Army brass went crazy. Uh, the chief spokesman for the Army in Vietnam, a guy named Colonel Campbell, uh, gave a speech to a bunch of public affairs officers in which he called Stars and Stripes the Hanoi Herald. And he was particularly upset at how specific I had been about the casualties. And in truth, being that specific about the casualties violated the ground work rules that we all operated on. But we felt at the time that that story, in order to be understood, you had to understand the truth of what had happened to them. And the colonel said whether these figures are true or not is completely beside the point. It is the opinion of USRV, the United States Army Vietnam, such stories do not border on treason, they are treason. Pretty heady stuff for a young guy to have the chief spokesman for the army call you a traitor. Um, but we survived that. 
The final story, and I knew you were hoping that that's how I would start this next section, involved a fight uh, that the Marines did in the spring of 1967 for a series of strategic hills uh, overlooking a base that would become very famous the next year, Quezon. And the North Vietnamese occupied these hills and the Marines had been fighting for about a week to retake them. And I'd gotten wind of this fight, uh, and word of it hadn't reached Saigon yet, and through some pretty clever maneuvering on my part, um, I managed to get out to where this company was getting ready to make the final assault on Hill 881 North. And I thought, I've got this story to myself. And I realized once I got out there how big a battle it was. It turns out at that point in the war, it was the bloodiest battle of the war. Uh, something approaching 700 guys were either killed or wounded in the week of fighting that was there. And so I loaded my camera up with color film. Now in those days, if you were a freelancer, black and white was the way to go. Newspapers couldn't reproduce color. The only people who could use color pictures were, oh, let's just pick a random publication, Life Magazine. So I'm starting to think, this is my cover. And then she shows up. <laughs> Catherine Leroy was a French freelance photographer. And um, like me, not a lot of experience, like me, pretty young. Uh, she was one tough cookie. She actually got banned for six months from the Marine Area of Operations because she cursed out a Marine officer in language so vulgar, even the Marines were offended. <laughs> and that was her second language. <laughs> I can only imagine what she was like in, well, I, I actually do know what she was like in French. So I said rather grandly to Kathy, who hadn't realized yet what a big deal this was, Kathy, you go ahead and shoot black and white. I need some color for my portfolio. Essentially saying to her, you get all of the newspaper and wire service business and chances are I'm not really gonna get much of anything. So we start up the hill and we got all the way to the top of the hill and uh, nobody had shot at us. So the Marines thought, you know, the battle's over. But when we got to the top of the hill, North Vietnamese soldiers dug in, dug in in small little holes, spider holes they were called, started popping up out of the ground among us, in front of us, behind us, alongside us, and uh, started killing Marines um, who were throwing grenades at them. This, uh, this fella is a, a young lieutenant. Uh, the fella that he's trying to pull down to safety died. This, uh, this fella, lying on the ground, was shot in the neck. The fella looking down on him was a, a staff sergeant, and the guy on the left was a Navy corpsman. Um, and when the battle was over, we packed up our wounded and got out of there. Now, Kathy made some nice pictures. This is one of Kathy's pictures. And chances are, if you've seen any kind of collection of Vietnam pictures, you've seen Kathy's pictures. By the time the fight was over that night, it was too dark to get a helicopter in. So we spent the night out there. The next morning, um, I got wind that a helicopter was coming in just around the bend a little bit. So I ditched Kathy and got the helicopter and made incredible connections back to Saigon. Helicopter to Da Nang, C-130 to Saigon. I was in the Life Magazine office at 9 a.m. the next morning. And I come in and the guy who's man in the office is somebody I'd never seen before. It was his second day in Vietnam. And I said, I have exclusive color pictures of the biggest battle of the war. And he said, well, great, we'd be happy to look at them. And I said, well, you're gonna have to pay me something for the right of first look, which was a common practice. I need $2,000 for that. And he said, well, I don't know who you are. I'm not gonna pay you $2,000. Now, everybody in the press corps Saigon knew who I was, except this guy. Um, and this is where being young and stupid um, really shows up. I got my back up. That made me mad. So I stormed out of his office, walked over to the AP office. They developed the film. And I said, what, what am I going to do? And they said, well, Perry Match might be interested. Perry Match was the French equivalent of Life magazine. So they tell ex Perry Match, said, yeah, we're interested. Put it on the Air France flight to Paris that's leaving in a couple of hours. So I put all my film on the Air France flight going to Paris. Now, and this is before digital. That was the only copies on that jet going to Paris. And now Kathy has made her way to Saigon. 
And word has gotten back to Saigon what a big battle this is. So the Life magazine guy's looking all over town for me. And I say, well, they're on their way to Paris. Perry Match, when they found out that a French woman had been at the battle, didn't care that she was shooting black and white. And my color pictures were of no use to them whatsoever. So there's her picture of a wounded guy on the hill. There's my picture of a wounded guy on the hill. I personally think my picture's a lot better, but you know, there you go. Um, incidentally, the wounded guy, I, I took those pictures and crawled further up the hill. I assumed he died because he had an awful wound in the neck. It was maybe 10 years ago I found out he was still alive. William Vizera is his name, Willie. And just this past weekend, Becky, my wife Becky and I were in Las Vegas at a reunion of these Marines and I got to meet Bill face to face. And uh, he's, he's, uh, he's in pretty good health and a funny, nice, charming guy. And he was as eager to meet me as I was him. And this is one of the things about being a, a combat correspondent or a war photographer. I spent less than 24 hours with these guys, but it was a pretty nasty 24 hours and they treat me like I'm one of them. They invite me to their reunions. In fact, I went to one about 10 years ago and then have begged off on every other one and they just finally put so much pressure on me this year that, that I went and it was, and it was worth it. There's the cover that never was. <laughs> so, those are my war stories, um, and I'm willing now and eager to entertain questions. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, if you haven't gotten enough of my pictures by the time the evening's over, Vietnamphotography.com has lots of my pictures. Yes, sir? Were you ever witness any war crimes? And if you were, were they ever recorded? Well, it depends on how you define a war crime, I guess. A lot of the shelling and bombing that we did was pretty indiscriminate, and I think that that could be considered a war crime. But if you're asking, did I ever, did I witness anything like My Lai or the wanton murder of uh, civilians or prisoners? No, I didn't. For the most part, our guys behaved as honorably as soldiers can behave in combat, for the most part. There were some guys who did not behave particularly well. Yes, sir? These photos were, were when you were civilian. Some of them were civilian. The, the ones in the Hep Duck Valley where I read the story, I was in the military when I took those. Not when I worked for Stars and Stripes. That was the best gig you could have in the Army. I wore civilian clothes. The Commander-in-Chief Pacific had ordered the uh, people in Vietnam to treat Stripes correspondents and photographers the same way they treated civilians. The uniform, the, the jungle fatigues I wore uh, in the field had no rank insignia or branch insignia. Had my name and Stars and Stripes. So, no. And, and Stripes was not censored. We were the only defense-related publication in theater that wasn't censored. And in fact, we had the only uh, teletype link out of the country that the Vietnamese government couldn't pull the plug on. So from time to time, we would transmit AP stories or New York Times stories if the Vietnamese had decided to close the circuits down. Yes, sir? What kind of cameras were you using? Mostly I used Nikon Fs for uh, when I had lenses like 105 and 200 and Leica M2s for the wide-angle lenses. I shot Tri-X exposed at 400 ASA, and the color was high-speed ectochrome exposed at 160 ASA. And the reason that some of those color pictures are as funky as they are is it was getting pretty darn dark uh, when I was taking them, and I was pushing that film to its absolute limits. Yes, sir? It's like a lot of them shot without warp. Did they shoot much in two-core? Some. The, 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 uh, the APC story was uh, in two-core. But I was there in 66, 60, 67, 60, 66, 67, and 69, 70. And for the most part, the war in the Delta wasn't all that interesting. And two corps wasn't that interesting. <laughs> Depending, unless you were getting shot at in two corps, then it was damned interesting. But I, I liked being up with the Marines because they're nuts. 
Um, and I liked being with the first cab and the 101st because they had a lot of helicopters and I didn't have to walk as much. So, yes, ma'am. Yes and yes. Um, generally speaking, if there was somebody wounded, there was somebody else there to take care of them. My job was to document it. But there were lots of occasions where I would take some pictures, do a little bandaging, take some pictures, do a little bandaging. The guy uh, in the, Val Saint, the, the Valentine's Day uh, one where we're pinned down in the open, I ended up patching up one of those guys. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you remember that picture. I'm running on the left with the helmet and he's here. And I like to point out to anybody who thinks that I'm being particularly heroic, all the gunfire was coming from that direction. <laughs> and I looked that guy up about 10 years ago, uh, Lyle Thomas, he was 19 at the time, he's from Asheville, North Carolina. I looked him up and I made that joke to him. He did not think that was funny. Uh, and uh, um, some guys just don't have much of a sense of humor, I guess. But it, it's always, it's always a, a, a dilemma. But I, I did a lot of battlefield first aid. Yes, sir? Did your opinion of the war change after World War II? After the years? Well, through the years, they increased the stakes. Was your opinion of the war different from what it was in 1960? When I went over there in 1966, I mean, I went to Grinnell College in Iowa. And if any of you know about Grinnell College, it's a hotbed of liberalism. Uh, and so I went over there being very skeptical of the war. I came home very skeptical of the war. I was pretty convinced that it, we'd been sent on a fool's errand. But what did change for me was my attitude towards the soldiers. I fell in love with grunts, with infantrymen. They're my kind of people. They have the same dark, twisted sense of humor that I have. And it became a mission of mine, both in that war and I've covered the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, to make sure that the American public understands what we ask our young men and now women to go through when we send them off to war. Um, and I want to make sure uh, that they are treated with the respect that I think that they deserve. The Vietnam veterans were not treated as well as one might hope. Uh, today, you see a group of uh, veterans getting off an airplane in a, in a civilian airport and people stop and give them a round of applause. That didn't happen so much in the Vietnam era. So that's what changed for me. I, I developed a lifelong romance with grunts. Yes? Uh, did you have to uh, go back The question was, did I often get feedback uh, about my pictures from the States? Not so much, because in those days there wasn't any kind of real instantaneous communication. You know, it was all by letters. And uh, most of the time, people who might have taken umbrage at my pictures or people who liked my pictures wouldn't know how to reach me anyway. It would have been hard. I did have one thing happen. After that uh, story in the, in the Hep Duck Valley, when there was so much criticism from the military brass, I got a phone call one day from a, a, a medic. And uh, he said, hey, listen, we really like your story. We've been reading the other stuff you do. We really like it. We'd like to do something for you. And I said, well, that's very nice of you. But he says, would you like a Jeep? <laughs> I said, well, no, I, I, you know, I really couldn't use a Jeep. Well, how about a case of Thorazine? Uh, th Thorazine is an injectable tranquilizer that they were using to help combat combat fatigue. But it was also uh, a very popular street drug in the United States because it was a good antidote for bad LSD trips. Uh, so he was offering me up a case. I think a case had 240 ampules of Thorazine in it. And I, I told him I didn't really think I could do that either. <laughs> so that's the kind of feedback you would get from time to time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was there the first time uh, a little more than a year, and uh, I came back right after those hill battles when I didn't get the cover on Life magazine, and I just said, this hell with this. Uh, and I wanted to get back in time to finish my senior year in college. I did, 
I did actually graduate from college, uh, in case anybody thought I got hired here with just three years. Um, and then I went back because it was still a big story and I knew how to tell that story. Yes, Peter. I'm not sure what's changed more, warfare or journalism in the 50 years, but 50. There, are there lessons from your experience as a photographer, photojournalist from that period to, to students of this era who have that idea that they want to do that as a career? Yes, I think there are lessons, and one of the lessons was uh, that I pointed out that you have to listen very skeptically when the military puts out their version of events. Uh, that was a problem in Vietnam, it was a problem in Iraq, it was a problem in Afghanistan, it's a problem today with uh, uh, intelligence reports about our, how successful we're being combating ISIS, being the books on that being cooked to make it look better. So just you have to maintain a high level of skepticism. The thing that's difficult about journalists covering wars in the military is that generally speaking with the general public, the military's credibility is higher than journalism's credibility. Um, and so it's a, you're fighting an uphill fight, but you have to, as we say in journalism, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, the, there's a very interesting two-volume book uh, about the history of media and the military in Vietnam that was actually done by the Army Historical Branch, who was, was commanded at that time by General Jack Montcastle, uh, who's on the faculty at the Jepson School here. And that volume pretty much debunks the widely held belief among military people that the media lost the war. Public opinion in the United States about the war was pro-war until 1968. And two things happened in 1968 that changed it. Um, up until then, the military had been talking about how successful they'd been, how many NVA they'd killed, how many Viet Cong they'd killed, the light at the end of the tunnel, this war, we're winning this war. And then comes January 1968, the Tet Offensive. And the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese launched coordinated attacks on every major population center and every major military base in the country. Now, they got their tails handed to them. We killed them by the tens of thousands. It was a tactical defeat for the, the communist forces because they were really severely weakened for months after that. But it was a strategic victory because back home the American public said, wait a second, if we've been winning this war and we've weakened them so much, how were they able to do this? And that's when the public opinion polls started going this direction. Second thing happened in 1968, and that was the uh, government announced that they were going to do away with the student deferment for the draft. If you were in college before then, you, didn't, you weren't eligible for the draft until you were out of college. And I think the effective date was November of 1969. College students were suddenly available for the draft. And that meant that anti-war demonstrations in Washington that had had 50,000 people went to 250,000, thank you very much, college boys. Um, and middle class families who hadn't been particularly touched by the war up to that point, suddenly realized the sons of doctors and lawyers and small businessmen uh, were eligible for the draft and were drafted. And that's when the bottom fell out of public opinion on the war. 
But you're right, they were very w aware of uh, what impact their actions were having on public opinion in America. What year was that? 69. 69, yeah. I, I went through. Well, in, that's, in my basic training company in, in August of 68, the average educational level was 13 and a half years. We had more college graduates and post uh, graduate students than we had high school dropouts. And it, boy, was that a problem for the drill sergeants. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe two more questions and then we'll uh, retire. Beg your pardon? Earl right, Sean. Oh, I'm painfully familiar with them. He and my pal Dana Stone were in Cambodia and they were riding a motorcycle, motorcycles out to find where the action was and they vanished and we had no idea what had happened to him. This would have been April of 1970. We had no idea what had happened. It was years later, Tim Page actually led the investigation. They had been held by the Khmer Rouge for about a year. And then for some reason, we don't know why, uh, they were walked out into a field and clubbed to death with shovels and buried. Uh, so, uh, you know, Dana could be kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, but Sean was very charming. I don't. I don't know what went wrong. But there were 23 journalists killed in Cambodia that year. It was a big mess as far as journalists were concerned. One last question. Yes, sir. So you would find reporters from that era who were over there when you were to your students in the curriculum. Uh, who are they and why? Yeah, I do. Uh, we just had Peter Arnett on campus. Uh, Peter won a Pulitzer Prize in 1966 in Vietnam. And uh, he came and spoke uh, with small groups of students and a and a movie screening. Some of you were probably at that screening. Joe Galloway is coming in a couple of weeks, October 23rd, I think. He was uh, in the first battle of uh, the Yidrang Valley in 1965, and he and the commanding officer of the American unit there, Hal Moore, wrote a book called We Were Soldiers Once and Young that was turned into a movie. And so we're screening that movie, and Joe will be here to talk about that movie, and that's open to the public. So but right now, uh, there's, well, you tell them. So please join us for the thank you. And now we want you to see the exhibition of, of his photographs. So please join us in the museum to see uh, the exhibition when you have these questions. Thank you. Where? Where? Follow me. Follow the crowd. <laughs>